is our support from um, from NRFC. Um, and uh, if you could just introduce yourself, Andrew, and what organisation you're from. Yeah. Hi, everybody. So Andy Goldring from the Permaculture Association. Nice to meet you all today. Great. So how we're going to um, do this session is we'll really be using the chat function, which you can see here, the button um, on your, on your um, Zoom uh, panel you see the chat function there um, that would be really good if you could pose questions there um, as you think of them when the speakers are speaking it'd be really great if everybody could introduce themselves on chat and say a bit about what brings them here or if they've got any ideas but it'd be really nice to to uh, to use it as a sort of network opportunity as well and we'll save the chat content as well because that doesn't automatically um, save when when a uh, session is recorded but we'll make that available to anybody who wants it. We'd really appreciate it if everybody could keep themselves on mute just to try and keep um, the signal as strong as possible for everybody and, and the sound as clear as possible. Um, and we'll bring in questions periodically um, if uh, for people who wanted to raise their hands and so on as, as the session goes on. And we're going to start off with, um, with three short presentations just about projects that um, our speakers have been involved in. And then it's open to a, a plenty of room quickly to move into discussion. Um, and Q&A and so on and sharing ideas and, and really sort of bashing heads around um, some ideas that um, people in the audience might have. So our panel today, we've got um, a fantastic mix today. We've got Despina from ADAS, who, um, who is um, a researcher with ADAS and has been working on a field lab in Innovative Farmers Programme, looking at deeper um, burrowing earthworms with um, an on-farm project, which is really exciting. We've got Richard Copley as well, and he's come, he's a farmer and a tree surgeon, and he's been doing um, a field lab looking at biochar, and he'll tell us more about that. We've got Judith Conroy from Coventry University, also part of um, a wider collaborative um, uh, uh, organisation within that, where Judith has also been um, doing a field lab um, with some growers looking at alternatives to plastic mulch use. I'm Kate Pressland. I'm the programme manager for Innovative Farmers. and I'll be the chair. Um, I've been working in um, on-farm trials and this collaborative approach of bringing farmers and researchers together in field labs since 2013. So we're all here today to discuss ideas for research, specifically on farm priorities that farmers have now or in the, in the future. Um, as this is a Northern um, Conference, the Northern Real Farming Conference, it would be great to hear about any specific regional issues that require more research too. A lot of our field labs have been more Southern based and so we're really looking for opportunities to, to um, help farmers and researchers work together um, more on priorities that are regionally specific. We'll also discuss how farmer-led research works, um, you know, how, how it actually comes to be. So hopefully you'll finish the session feeling quite inspired to do more research or consider research on your farms and also how to set up some trials yourself. So I'll pass over to Despina now, who's a soil and crop researcher with ADAS, working on the field lab, as I mentioned before, on deeper rooting earthworms and soil health. So thanks, Despina. Thanks, Kate. Thanks for sharing. So can you all see my presentation? Yes. Thank you. So hi everyone. So I'm Despina. I'm a plant and soil scientist at ADAS. Um, and I'm just going to talk a bit about my experience of working as part of the Deeper Rooting Field Lab, um, which has been funded by Innovative Farmers this year. Um, so firstly, the Deeper Rooting Field Lab is uh, for farmers um, who've been conducting trials in their farms. And I've been uh, fulfilling the role of the researcher and coordinator of the project. Um, supported by some of my colleagues at ADAS um, also. So just a bit of background firstly about what we're doing in the field lab, just to um, give you a bit of background. So the Deep Rooting Field Lab is really looking at um, testing the impact of soil management on crop rooting depths and yield through encouraging deep burrowing earthworms. And through doing this, we've been comparing um, manure and cultivation treatments and really monitoring impacts on earthworms, um, crop rooting and, and yield. And this really stems from looking at this group of um, earthworms called the anisic earthworms, which are the deep burrowers, and um, the effects that they have on soil structure and consequently on crops and their root performance. So this is just an example of one of our trials. So this was um, Rory Lay in Shropshire, and as an example of um, some of the field experiments people are doing. So this is his field and 
So he's got some different treatments looking at strip tillage um, versus deep cultivation, and then whether or not having family admin manure um, additions um, has an impact as well. So that's just an example of one of the field trial setups. And through the course of the field lab um, across the year, we'll be measuring a whole set of different um, aspects of, of the of soil biology and, and soil properties, but these include earthworm, earthworm population counts, and looking at a set of um, aspects of soil, um, soil properties, so soil strength, um, visual soil assessments, and some of the soil chemistry and um, other properties. And additionally, we've been doing um, more detailed observations of crops in the field and how their roots develop, and also taking measurements of the yields um, at harvest. And then we've been using our um, agronomics tool to actually compare whether there's differences in yield between some of the field, trial, um, the field trials that have been set up. So as background for how this came about, so the deeper rooting field lab is actually slightly different to some of the innovative farmers standard um, field lab setups in that we'd already run for a year before we got funding from innovative farmers. But in terms of the um, the idea behind this is very similar. So it basically arose from a group of farmers coming together. In this case, it was part of the YEN. So this is ALS's um, Yield Enhancement Network. And they had a, a yield testing ideas lab to bring together ideas to really farmers to discuss ideas about um, improving crop performance sustainably on their farms and to really kind of get, get ideas um, bouncing around and thinking about what, what farmers would actually like to test. And so um, as part of this, four, four farmers really kind of um, kind of came together and, and developed the idea behind the Deep Rooting Field Lab. Um, and with research from ADAS, um, we've kind of devised um, the trials and kind of um, an appropriate way of testing the hypotheses that they wanted to look at in more detail. So innovative farmers funded this the second year and we became what's called a field lab. And um, this picture on the right really just shows kind of one of the talking points that got the farmers going um, kind of um, ideas flowing for this field lab, which was the observation by farmers that um, roots often follow earthworm burrows um, deeper into the soil. And so this kind of led to the question of whether improving earthworm numbers would be able to improve um, the crop rooting depths in the field. So um, as a bit of a summary of the, the experience, really, I think it's been, in my, in my opinion, very positive. I think some of the key benefits really have been that it's because it's been a farmer led piece of research the trials have been very relevant to each farmer's growing system and they've really been able to test ideas which are relevant to them and of interest to them and their farming practices in the future. Through working with research, I think we've been able to devise quite a robust and um, kind of statistically meaningful way of collecting the data and kind of approaching the idea of conducting trials. And I think another of the key benefits really has been that um, through this method of working, we've really been able to exchange knowledge and kind of have a very um, kind of group learning experience um, that's been kind of beneficial all around for sharing ideas and knowledge. Um, and uh, this is just showing our, the, a summary of our field lab um, on the Innovative Farmers website if you're interested in looking at it further. So thanks everyone, that's, uh, that's me finished for now, thank you. Hi Dan, if you're able to put a link to that field lab on the chat, that would be really, really helpful. Thank you very much, Despina. Um, our next speaker um, is Richard Copley, who was involved in a field lab looking at biochar as a farmer and tree surgeon. There you go, Richard. Uh, um, is this setting up? Oh yeah, lovely. Is that okay? All can see. Not come up yet. Is it not? No, not yet. Okay. Here we go. Yes, there we go. That's good. Wearing away. Lovely job. Well, um, yeah, so obviously from the farmer experience, um, for me, um, I initially, uh, well, I looked at innovative farmers online and there was an opportunity at a, a, an agroforestry event. Um, so obviously this stage one initial inquiry um, and uh, so I just for other farmers out there I want to say that however crazy however wacky your idea is um, this is a great platform um, to 
put your ideas out there. For me, it was easy because all I had to do was write it on a piece of paper. To be honest with you, I didn't expect much back at the time. Um, then I got an email, read by HR saying that they'd looked into it and would like to set up a meeting basically, um, which then brought us to our first time meeting, um, which then we had a, a group of us together um, another set of farmers there that were looking into direct drilling biochar uh, into their crops and then obviously myself um, uh, feeding obviously it was my barbecue charcoal waste to cattle which again it's a bit out there but again was very much supported um, and then from there they sort of looked at mine because it was um, I suppose it's a lot easier to do and implement and they could, uh, because again, it's bringing the lab uh, to the practical um, and trying to implement something that would work and we could get some results from. Um, we then had the follow-up meeting, read that and sort of what sort of strategy we were going to take um, and put together. Um, we sort of then... Uh, came to the conclusion that um, well we were initially going to look at uh, nitrate levels um, trying to reduce them leaching from the feces at the end of the animal uh, and improve the efficiencies within the gut so we could look um, so as you can see uh, around here um, these were some of the results uh, that we got um, so you could see it on paper um, also um, we were looking at um, worm counts as well, uh, which we used FET pack, which was quite interesting to use gear that obviously um, I hadn't seen before. Um, and then working with Donna, uh, this lady here, which was the researcher that I'd been put in touch with, um, who was very, very good, um, really efficient and uh, really knows his stuff. And again, very adaptable and also, uh, she had a farming background as well so it was nice to have that sort of rapport um both sides and learn so much from her as well um so yeah then we went into the trial aspects uh, so this picture here um as you can see these are the two different feces samples we got and uh, that's with by jar and without um so anecdotally i saw difference in the animals uh, behavioural wise, the way that they fed, uh, also again smell with manure, one of them was looking at uh, ammonia levels, um, however because uh, we didn't test it um, at the time we couldn't, uh, it didn't show any difference, so for future trials that may be a case to, to change. Um, obviously so yeah there's the results, um, as I said it was really, it was a fantastic process of good communication um and again i didn't feel at any point um you're well within communication basically um which then obviously led us on to stage three four five so on and such forth um we're now at that point looking into where it goes next um i can't discuss too much as i spoke with donna today um, where we are we've had a few upsets as well uh, trying to get further research um, but again that's all part of that process but we are now moving forward um, and hopefully going to expand, expand that um, and see where it really go can go from there which I think that's the most interesting part for me um, is that from something small we can grow into something quite big um, a bit like the snowball effect um, and obviously there's plenty of research out there but it'd be brilliant for uh, UK agriculture to <laughs> really go forward with this um, for me it's always been interesting because it's a way of utilizing our waste on our farm uh, from a tree surgery and sort of adapting it into the farm as well um, so yeah if you are thinking about it and you are watching this i do recommend doing it um however as i said wacky an idea it is go for it um yeah it's cool lovely job 
Thank you very much, Richard. Um, if you want to um, stop the screen share and it'll bring us, bring us back to everybody. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Our final speaker is um, Judith Conroy, who uh, joins us from Coventry University Centre for Agroecology, Water and Resilience. And Judith has been working with growers investigating alternatives to plastic mulches. Thanks, Judith. Just bear with me a moment while I share my screen. It takes a couple of minutes to kick in. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. It's really nice to see that so many people have, have joined the session. Um, yeah, one of the other presenters commented that this first slide's a bit logo rich. Um, and the reason for that is the farm lab that, we, that we've been working on. For, for us, it's an extension of a, of, a, of a bigger project that we're involved with. So um, Organic Plus, it's a big European project that Coventry University is leading on. Um, and there's kind of there's 25 partners across Europe. There's all sorts of different areas that we're looking at. But in Coventry, from a practical point of view, we're, we're concentrating on one particular part of the project, looking at contentious inputs in organic agriculture that relate to the soil. Um, so I just thought I'd put this slide up just because it's got all our partner logos and just to kind of convey that it is part of a, of a, of a bigger project. But the um, main contentious inputs that we're looking at are Peter's growing media, um, non-organic animal manure as fertiliser, and then the one in particular that the farm lab is concerned with, which is the use of, of plastic. There's obviously lots of uses of plastic in agriculture, but this particular field lab focuses on the use of plastic film as a mulch, which seems to have become more widespread over the last, last few years. And obviously all, all the associated problems with that, with uh, microplastics and also plasticizers leaching for, from, the, um, from the films. And, you know, many other many other associated problems um, but in terms of the field lab side of things it's been a really really positive experience for me um, my background is mostly organic horticulture um, and domestic horticulture and so I've worked with gardeners before and been, in, been involved in lots of um, kind of citizen science things and exercises with with um, gardeners, but not as much um, to do with agriculture. Luckily, I, I work with um, colleagues into the Petty Francis Rain, some people may, may have come across, and he has a long history of having worked with farmers. Um, prior to working for the Centre for Agroecology, Water and Resilience, he worked for Garden Organic, and that was previously the Henry Doubleday Research Association. So we kind of, between of us, got, a, as I've got, you know, a background of this. But yeah, in terms of the, the innovative farmer side of things, the field lab, um, we began doing our trials for the Organic Plus project in 2019. Um, so we were looking at a range of different, different mulches. But a big part of the Organic Plus project is not only to kind of do the research, but it's to work with farmers and to disseminate our results to people and also to do um, on-farm modelling as well. So we want the input of farms. We want to know what people are doing on, the, on their farms because um, not at Coventry, but some other researchers in our project, mostly in Spain and Denmark, are um, looking at the, at the broader picture as well. Um, so we began our trials in spring last year, but in the summer we, we approached innovative farmers and it's maybe not the way around that it, that it normally happens because obviously innovative farmers is a farmer led exercise usually, but we thought this would be something that people were very much interested in. Um, since applying for the project, obviously plastics gained, gained a lot more profile and people started to become a lot more concerned about, about plastics in agriculture. Um, so in September of 2019, we had an open day, so we're quite lucky where we are. Um, we're based at Wrighton, which is just outside Coventry um, city centre, just outside the Ring Road. And um, we actually have a CSA based on our site called Five Acre Farm. So most of the trials that we do are actually in their field. Um, so a lot of the crops that we grow as part of our trials actually go into the, the share for the box scheme for the, for the CSA. So we already work with a grower, which, which is a great experience in itself. Um, 
and I think it, it really kind of helps us talk to other farmers because they can come and see what we're doing they can come and see that we're doing it as part of an existing farming system we're not just doing it in a field where all we do is research it's actually part of a working farm so yeah in September of last year we invited the people to come and have a look at what we were already doing so some people from Innovative Farms came and they helped drum up um, you know support from other uh, or attendance from other farmers and other growers um, and then to begin with we didn't have a coordinator but by our second day which was in February of this year we had Tony Little on board and Tony's been really great he's kind of dealt with the um, kind of the, the facilitation facilitation of the whole I can't say it, facilitation of the whole thing um, so he's kind of really um, sort of rallied with the rallied the farmers, asked them what they want, want what they need, and obviously helped to organise the funding for the, for the um, field lab as, as well. Because in a way, our, our research was going on regardless of this, but we obviously wanted to share it with other people. And we wanted the input of farmers as well. We wanted to know what, the, what you know, growers thought of what we were doing. So it was great to have them come um, to Five Acre and see what we were actually up to. Um, and then, yeah, really quickly, as soon as we'd kind of had our inaugural event with, with Tony facilitating, then things really gathered pace. Um, the funding was, was granted quite quickly and the farmer trials began within weeks, really. Um, and all this happened amid COVID. But I think luckily, as, as farmers and growers, most of us have been able to go, uh, go amongst our business unhindered and carry on with, um, with the trials. So, yeah, it's all up and running now. Um, this summer I went down to uh, one of the, the, there was a video that I think I shared on the, um, I can't remember what the name of the notice board is for the event, but I shared on there that you can see, and it's also on the Organic Plus Twitter feed, but I visited um, Ben Cood Adams at um, Farm Down in Essex growing black currants and had a look at how their trial was, was progressing. And that was, you know, really interesting. And we're now at, this, at the point where we're going to start to see results coming in from, from farmers in the next few weeks. So, yeah, um, I can talk a little, it depends how much time we've got. I can talk a little bit more about the actual plastics trial. Um, if there's time, Kate, or... Um, we, we have a little time, yeah, a couple of minutes. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'll do I'll do a few more slides. So, um, I didn't know how much you wanted to do. Um, so, yeah. So we wanted to evaluate a range of biodegradable and non-biodegradable film mulches. So Becca, um, the grower that we work with already, she was already using a commercially available biodegradable film mulch. Um, but we also looked at a range of others as well. Um, so we've got other partners in our project and our Polish partner, um, that's CUT, you can see under um, 0.7 and 8 there. So that's a um, Chester Cove University of Technology. So they're material scientists and they've been developing um, a degradable mulch made from potato starch. And I think most of the ones you can get hold of at the moment are made from corn starch. So we're quite interested in what the, um, how, how they'll compare. Um, in the first year, the um, mulches developed by the Polish partner didn't, didn't do very well. They were brittle, but this year they've, they've done a lot better. Um, so yeah, we looked at two commercially available degradable mulches. Um, we also looked at the, the um, plastic alternatives. So we looked at polyethylene, which is kind of the standard, and also Mipex. So that's like the, the geotextile that a lot of growers use. Um, when our partners do life cycle analysis of these things, we'll be quite interested to see how the Mipex does, because although it is fossil fuel derived and it is a plastic, it does have the advantage that it can be taken up and stored over winter and used year after year. I think Becca's got some pieces which are at least 10 years old, so that, that's going to be quite interesting um, to see. Um, so yeah, we've taken soil samples prior to laying our different mulches, because um, as well as the microplastics, we're interested in what kind of compounds might leach. Um, there have been studies in China which have found that chemical compounds such as salates can leach into the soil from the plastic mulches. So that's something that we're very keen to, to find out about. Um, we've got a colleague who's joined us recently and now our laboratories are open again, which is a, a relief. So we can start to look for that as well. Um, our um, trial participants, the field lab participants have obviously grown diff 
different crops, you know, whichever crops are most relevant to them. But we've chosen to focus on onions and cabbages. Um, primarily, I think, because the onions tend not to cover the soil very well and are prone to getting quite weedy, whereas cabbages grow nice and wide and cover the soil a lot better. So they're kind of two contrasting crops that we think will be, will be good to compare. Yeah, so this, this big tear, this was the um, material from our Polish partner. I think the big problem with it was that it was white. So it acted as a greenhouse and let the greens, let the um, weeds grow beneath and they kind of bust it open, unfortunately. But this year they came up with a, a black alternative, which has, has performed a lot better. Um, if I just go to the results, it kind of speaks for, for itself. Um, the um, onion, onion harvest is kind of pretty quick, clear cut. The control that wasn't weeded had a really poor harvest. And so did the um, two mulches, which broke down too quickly. Um, it's quite interesting. The one that it, the cut one only lasted like a week or two longer than cut two. And that seemed to be enough to actually equal a meaningful harvest though. So just because one thing, one thing that was interesting when we spoke to growers, obviously they don't want the, the, the mulch to last for too long as well, that that's a concern. Um, they don't want it to hang around. They do want it to break down. So trying to get the, the balance right is a really um, interesting thing. And it's, it's, you know, definitely been good to have that input from growers to tell us what, what they want. Um, I won't go on to the cabbage as well because it's kind of it's kind of similar. I suppose another important thing to mention is that we've got partners in Turkey um, not carrying out identical trials to us, but very similar trials with some of the same material. So that's going to be quite interesting as well to see what um, partners in another part of the world are doing. But yeah, just to and if anyone's got any more questions about the trial, I've kind of rattled through that a bit quickly, but I don't know how much detail people would want. So thanks. Yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard to so much research to put into a, um, a short space of time. So we appreciate that. And what we can do with um, with this session is is link to further research. We can also maybe um, follow up with some of the work that you're doing and make that available um, on the NRFC website or, or on Innovative Farmers website. So we, we should be able to do some follow up where, where we can't cover everything. Um, I've been checking on the chat and there aren't any um, research questions that have come up. Um, at the moment, so I'm going to I'm going to give some time for the grey matter to think of some research questions of priorities for the farmers that are present. But those presentations give you a flavour of the kinds of work that have been happening in in farmer led research, and also those examples show how there might already be research happening, but then the, it's connecting up where something is of interest to the farmers um, and a priority for them right now, linking that up with research that may or may not already be happening and just making that connectivity much stronger. And I'd like to ask the panel members that, um, so from the researcher's point of view, um, working with farmers is obviously beneficial, but do you find that actually including farmers much more in sort of co-design from the start, centering around the trial and, and all of that knowledge exchange, do you find that that actually changes your research thinking going forward? Do, do you think that there is a tangible difference in how you would then approach your, ne your next grant application, for example? I think, you know, certainly from a farmer's point of view, would like to know that their input is, is going into into you know uh, furthering into the research agenda do you find if I start with um Despina first do you find that that's that's happened or do you think there's great potential for it yeah definitely I mean I think particularly from my point of view so I don't come from a farming background and actually some of the practicalities of um doing doing the farm trials and kind of the more technical aspects like the machinery and kind of um things you would consider when setting up a trial in terms of drilling the crop um things which I definitely learned a lot more about through working closely with the farms in our team. Um, I like to think it's been an exchange of knowledge because um, I think they've learned about kind of some of the aspects of measuring soils and earthworms from us as well. So yeah, definitely. And, and Judith, do you find that this has um, had an effect on how you approach research thereafter? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, this year it's actually changed what we what we decided to do. So this is right see a lot that we that we could look into and we had decided just to focus on the um, films things that which are, are film like on, on the soil but because quite a lot of the farmers expressed an interest in wanting to look at loose mulches so things like wood chip um, our blackcurrant farmers been using wood chip 
and also some year old wood chips. So we're really interested to see how they vary. So we kind of found the time this year to also do a small loose mulch trial as well. We, you know, we, we had wanted to originally, um, but even though we'd made the decision not to, we kind of changed our minds again, having spoken to the growers, we just kind of, we couldn't ignore it. So yeah, um, definitely have a, you know, have an influence on us and, and how we go about things as well, not just what we do, but how we do it. Mm, interesting. And Richard, for, for your part, do you, how, did you find as a farmer that you found accessing research or evidence and things you were interested in, did you find that quite easy? Or did you find that you never had time to look up really? And so you just kind of had to crack on with um, either either doing trials yourself or or sort of um, rather than formal trials, you know, dabbling with with varieties or breeds or whatever, whatever it is. And um, what was your experience prior to this? And, and do you think that it's been really helpful having a research around your kitchen table, so to speak? Um, uh, what's been your experience? Uh, definitely, because uh, for me, um, you're lining yourself with the lab and um, so our trials ourselves would be me researching it online um, and finding other people doing things out there but I didn't really get the the sort of um, the quantitative side of things it was more my anecdotal the, the sort of characteristics of the cattle noticing the difference in their Sort of the feces smell of it and um, we like when i first initially did it it was very much me recording smell tests so getting literally the manures within sort of centimeters of my face before smelling it and then it having almost quite a sweet smell to it uh, compared to cattle that hadn't been fed on it uh, so then to be linked with the labs and get some like i said some hard quantitative data was yeah really helpful um it also it, the things that you are doing you go well, actually and linking that then with what you've looked at it sort of brings the picture together may i ask um richard as well your your graph in your slides was very small it was quite hard to see could you right. kind of summarize in a nutshell what you've learned so far of the biochar trial that you've done um you know what, what, have you got any of those findings that you're now applying in um, your day-to-day -day management I think what well, Dan put on there is the so that sort of data you can get on the Inuit farmers. Um, it, in a way, it hasn't really changed that aspect as such. We still feed it to the cattle as part of. Well, it it, it reiterates the fact that why I'm doing it that um, it, it is having a benefit down the line. Um, so obviously, um, with that less being. Um, released into the waterways and such you're keeping it where you want it um and the efficiencies of the animal hopefully because of that are improving so we're getting a fatter beast a better quicker faster fatter beast basically hmm. um so yeah hopefully May I ask, where did you where did you originally sort of get that idea from to start feeding to your cattle um, where did you first sort of see that and, and roughly when for me it was i've always been fascinated with utilizing um waste um in tree surgery we saw a lot of it and i suppose for me it was we've gone down kiln dried firewood uh, we did buy uh, barbecue charcoal and uh, we do biomass we heat our housing from it uh, and it was literally that and it was sort of looking at wood chip could i spread it on the field and we do actually use our wood chip for bedding and such um, and all those sort of you put that all into a computer and then it ended up on my searches um, with all cookies and all that uh, basically coming across by a jar and then kept on reading it looking at people like Kelpie Wilson um, Kathleen Draper the International Bar Jar Initiative um, again the Thacker Institute in Europe and what they've been doing uh, carb effects people like that um, and I just went oh wow fantastic um, and from that um, I just started looking more tried it ourselves um and yeah sort of again that snowball effect to where we are today so initially it was the interest of utilizing our waste basically so we've got we've got um a couple of questions from bill grayson in um in our audience that's saying um how palatable is the biochar and how is biochar different from charcoal you know how is it how is it made well um so in terms of palatability um one thing we found in fact uh, when we initially did it, 
they don't like it in larger chunks. Uh, they will, the odd one might play with it and chew on it, um, but in part of their feed, they'll eat everything around it. Um, we actually ground it up originally in the trials to, um, I think it was about 10 mil or something, very small anyway, a lot of it very powdered. In that case, every last bit was gone. Um, it would be a yeah, hoovered up sort of thing. Um, so that made it more palatable. Even in the test, we at the moment probably feed no more than 20 grams per head. But in the trial we did, we wanted to get the maximum amount of carbon without it affecting. And we had, I think it was 300 grams per head. And it, initially it was quite a shock pouring it on the feed and you've got all this like black powder and you think, well, they, they lit, destroyed it, threw it. Um, which was quite amazing to watch. So yeah, it is, if you get it to the right consistency, palatable. Um, in terms of different from charcoal, uh, it's the process in which it's made. So we use uh, it's pyrolysis. Um, and so basically it's a chamber in the chamber. There are different forms of making it. We have an open kiln where um, basically you do it. So a bit like a match. Uh, when you see it burn, all you're left with is your carbon at the end. Basically, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to create as little waste from it and just having pure carbon, um, which is the technical term for biochar is explained the process in it's made and its use after. So they are pretty much the same, but again, um, it has to be done in pyrolysis process. Mm -hmm. um, in our case, we make it in an extra retort, uh, which is a kiln within a kiln, um, waste wood underneath, and then we burn off all the gases and then you're left with your carbon at the end. For us, we only, again, it's my interest in waste utilisation. So we sell the barbecue charcoal and then um, it's the fines after that we then grind down, feed with our cattle to what charcoal we have, basically. Um, yeah. That's and, um, and Richard, do you have any other, other research issues on your farm that you kind of got on the list to try and tackle? Are there any other kind of problems that are on your radar um, that you think actually when I've got time and time and space yes. that I would like to research? Um, no problems. I'm quite interested on uh, wood chip and bedding uh, benefits there. Um, also, I think there is a project you guys are doing with apple trees and wood chip as well as uh, apple scab uh, and willow wood chip. It's quite interesting. I think willow has got a lot to offer as a tree as it is anyway, but it'd be interesting as a wood chip, uh, especially like when come to like healing benefits and so. Because uh, yeah. we have a few, we have a few mixed and livestock farmers um in as participants in this session here so i'm wondering um you know if there are similar similar priorities coming up and so um somebody's popped um on here about uh feeding tree hay to livestock and measuring methane capture um it's, it's something that came up in an agroforestry session we yeah, ran earlier as well is that um is that something that um either of the researchers have heard about before is that something you've um heard about before richard um, I have. Um, in fact, originally when I uh, signed up for this, it was an, an agroforestry event there. Mm -hmm. um, we do. Um, so a lot of our hedge trimming from like beech hedges, hornbeam hedges, we do feed to our cattle direct. Um, and we have seen it with ch cherry wood chip cattle almost eating it as if it's feed uh, poured out the back of a truck sort of thing um so yeah we have looked into it and we, we do sort of do it depending on again what we have at the time and utilizing that great thank you i'm just ha having a quick scan um so uh, a question from john and um, thorns if you only grass feed could you feed bar char like a mineral rather than mixing it with the food would they you know could you create some kind of um, sort of like mineral lick or whatever if you just if you were um, grass based yeah there's some guys in oz that did it with molasses mixed it in with molasses okay. and because they looked into um um beetles um taking it and seeing how far they take the biochar under the surface um and the way they did that was with um 
like a thick molasses and then they put the bar char within it and obviously they ate the whole lot together um, in fact I think that was a lot larger chunks as well that they did mm. because of whatever consistency they enjoyed it mm, that's really interesting really interesting and um, one of the questions I have um, for uh, Judith and Despina uh, when it comes to, uh, we have a lot of farmers in the network that are interested in improving soil health as a big umbrella term. Um, and I can imagine that there are participants here as well that are interested in soil health as a general, wanting to improve the farm system. But it's extremely difficult to, under to know where best to spend your money on tests, which tests, how frequent. Um, what's, what's your kind of overall advice of, to people that are interested in monitoring and measuring and improving their soil health so that there's the earthworm encouragement that Desmond was talking about before but what would you say were your sort of top your top three things if I if I start with Desmond first that's a, a good question Kate um I mean I think yeah I mean there's a whole suite of things you can be looking at but I think um there's a big focus on looking at organic matter and um kind of getting getting kind of the organic matter in your soil kind of quantified. Um, that's definitely one that's important. Um, I think looking at kind of, I think actually just going into the field and looking in detail at your soil structure. And even if you just dig a soil pit and look at, just kind of look at the, the depth, through the depth of the soil, um, things like issues like compaction and crop rooting, you can get a good idea of kind of, if you've got any immediate issues or problems in the field. Um, and I think the, Looking at your soil biology is also quite important because you know it's kind of the foundation of your ecosystem. So if you've got a good, healthy uh, population of um, well, soil, bio soil biolog biological organisms like earthworms, then that's generally a good sign for kind of the health of your system and um, how your soil is doing. Um, yeah, but I think regular testing and attention to detail in terms of your soil is obviously very important. But it's, it's that sort of, with testing, there are all different, I mean, there's multiple companies providing all different kinds of tests. What, what would you say are your key, your key indicators? Because I think the cost can get pretty exponential. So you were saying there about organic matter, um, but it's, you know, soil biology is a quite a big umbrella term. And when you get down to the nuts and bolts, you know, really what are going to be your sort of your, your best buys, as research says at the moment, for, for monitoring your soil health? Um, is there any information from DEFRA or otherwise that, that can just guide you? Because, I, I mean, I talk to a lot of farmers that just say this, just, it's, you know, how, how big's your budget, basically? How, how often do you want to do this and what's practical on the farm? I don't know, is this an area that you work in as well, Judith? Um, I, th I think yeah, there there is there is the testing, but and I I kind of agree with Despina. Um, just actually, you know, looking at looking at at the soil, looking at what's actually in it. Um, there's obviously various tests that you can do by eye. You you can assess the organic matter um, normally by um, having putting the soil in it in a jar with some water and kind of seeing what what comes up there. So there are kind of ways that farmers can do it by feel, and also looking at uh, things like the kind of the kind of weeds that grow um, deficiencies in, uh, and there are lots of visual visual tests that, that people can do um, and, I th and I think soil coverage is really important as well so um, we've done quite a lot of work over the years with with green manures and you know obviously not not having you know avoiding bare soil where possible and I know it depends entirely on what and what the grower you know, is, is, is growing what, what crops they're, they're focusing on. But yeah, that's a really important thing. And I think that's something that, um, you know, if we are trying to move away from it from inputs, then, then growing um, fertility building crops is a, is, a, is a big one as well, a big area to look into. So we have, um, we have got um, an uh, IFID idea here about um, different ways of curing tree hay and what are the different nutritional characteristics if we were going to look at that as a trial what would be a good starting point really you know uh, you've got different ways of of curing the tree hay but then what would you be measuring what what would the what would the what would the kind of the ideal um levels of data to get for for evidence versus the practicality of what can be done on farm within the business because this isn't a research farm um, how would how would you um, go about even beginning to, to try to assess 
that kind of question about you know that you're looking at the nutritional characteristics but is it also seeing how they're utilized within the animal as well linking back a little bit to the biochar work you know what's what's the end result through through the animal as well as the actual process of of curing the tree hay in order to get the greatest amount of nutritional kind of availability um, out of it um if you were to if, uh, perhaps I should ask this to Jude if you if you were given that sort of question and as a, as a scientist to say where would you begin in designing a trial like that on farm what, what would your advice be or what would your first be your first things you think about I think the first thing would be to not try to record too many things I think people need to be comfortable with what they're you know what they are recording what they've got time to to measure as well so um for, for example I think most most of the participants in our trial participants in our trial have maybe only used half the number of treatments that we have so we've kind of done eight treatments most of them that have done maybe three or four um and then they're, they're doing measurements which are which are realistic for them um so and and some of it is just very visual or or things that can be done quite quickly walking through the crop so um when i the farmer visited recently um it, it was just a case of having a, a, a notebook and a ruler just to take crop heights and to count the number of um, black current cuttings which, which haven't survived so I think definitely only sort of take on what what you've realistically got time for um, by the same token if somebody does take on too much I think there's there's no shame in that there's no shame in, in not managing to keep up with what you intended to keep up and again we've heard back from some farmers who you know and they're really apologetic and there's really nothing to be sorry for and they'll still have information for us which it which is really useful I mean as, as well as needing hard data the anecdotal um, accounts from people are really important as well so to hear hear back from people what what did well what what didn't and um, that that still helps us that still might tell us things that we didn't know or it might give us areas which need further investigation it still points us in the right direction as researchers and it also helps us convey the story to other growers as well so it's yeah yeah it's a, just what you know what people are comfortable with really yeah absolutely so um we do we uh, the the tree hay questions have come from bill grayson i see bill's here i don't know if bill if you wanted to unmute yourself and and just to to share some of the thoughts that you have around this this is obviously an area that you're really interested in and maybe you could introduce, introduce yourself and tell us any of the work that you may have done in this already oh um, yes yeah, th thanks kate um so we 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 do a bit of um tree hay we've, we've done it for two or three years it, it's never um very specific it, it tends to just be bits of trees that have got in the way in the summer and um, we need to remove them cut them trim them um, so we end up with um, piles of, um, of of cut branches with a lot of green material on that um, we we'd, we'd read about tree hay so we tried um, preserving it in different ways um, and um, we've had it tested so we've got we've got already got a bit of data from different species um, sometimes the cattle really like it other times they don't seem to like it nearly so much so there's some some questions that, that it raises um, so um, you know it would just be um, just be interesting to know more from from the point of view of being able to utilize it better yes i think i think that's an interesting point i think it would be worth trying to understand it seemed like in the, the where this was raised in the in an agroforestry session earlier though you're not the only one interested in this area and obviously richard also mentioned his interest in this and i think one of the things that would be worth i think if you're interested in trialing which you kind of already are you know you're you're, you're sort of testing different things I wonder if there's um, it would be useful to find out how many people are interested in the same thing and, and bringing a group of people together to say all the different things they've tried and observations that they have so far and then trying to work out actually um, where's the common ground and and seeing um, if there's a way uh, of connecting with the researcher that happens to have experience in this arena yeah. and trying yeah, so to devise some kind of sort of you know see if there's a trial in there 
So, so when 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 Lindsay Winston was dis discussing it earlier on, um, I was already aware of that, having having spoken to her a few weeks ago. Um, so there's already that trial underway, um, mm -hmm. but the trouble is it's down south. So it's um, yeah. um, and I, I I would I would hope that we could liaising with them devise something that was um, uh, complementary to that you know looking Absolutely. at different because because the big problem i think lindsay has is getting funding to do to answer all the questions that are cropping up so maybe if some of those questions could mm. be asked through another trial mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. So the two were linked so that they yeah. they, they complemented each other rather than went over the same ground no, abs I think absolutely, and that's that's utterly possible. I think with with ways to connect like like this, it's easier than ever to be yeah. able to do that. I think we've got Rod Everett um, as well as said, you know, good project Bill. He would join in a in a leaf hay experiment as well. And I think you know it's something Richard indicated he was interested yeah, in. No, I, I think it's worth us talking about um, offline, and maybe we can put something out to our network to see are there any other people interested in this? And, and like you say, there is that trial going on down south, but it's, you know, it's only, um, it only adds to knowledge to have more people just getting their experience out there. I don't think there's ever a problem of, even if it was an, I, it, um, completely replicated, it's that's only adding data and adding knowledge rather than, yeah. Um, yeah. rather than losing anything. So I think that would be something we could, we could definitely, um, so scratch the surface of and see where where else there's interest because we've already got you know three <laughs> three in this room um that are that are interested in it which is which is very exciting great so are there any more ideas out there as well that we could uh, that we could discuss um so yes uh, there are some around soil health i mean is soil health something that people are particularly interested in there aren't that many of us in the room so please do feel free to unmute yourself and and um and start um discussing your ideas i'm just going to switch my lighting because i've lost lighting here um but um yeah please do feel free to unmute yourself i think we're a discreet enough a group that um it shouldn't interfere too much but um, if not, then I will I will keep asking questions, but interrupt away if there's an idea that that uh, comes to you. One uh, one thing I have noticed on um, in the participants is Keith Geary. Keith did a field lab a couple of years ago now um, with um, innovative farmers um, using uh, drone technology to look at um, dry matter in rare potatoes, which was really really interesting. I don't know if Keith, if you wanted to mention um any of the work that so you you did that work but what the farmers have then done with that information with that knowledge that they then got and how that idea came to be i wondered if you wanted to spend a minute just just talking about that and i think it's always really useful to know that yes research happens but what what came of it what what changed on farm is keith there are you there keith if not, then we'll come back. We'll come back to Keith. But if there's anybody else who'd like to um, raise their hand and any more ideas that they have, then that would be really, um, really great to hear from you. Is there something on your farm that's been really bugging you, or that you've you've dabbled in in a technique, and it's you, now you're at a point where actually you really want to get under the skin of it. You really want to understand what's the research out there. Um, is anybody else interested in this? I'd like to do something a little bit more concentrated. So Rod Steck. Yeah, one of the projects that I sort of feel really interested about is is the use of biofertilizers. Um, so, biofertilizers that are made from sort of fermented cow manure or fermented sort of ancient woodland soil to try and get the microbial activity. Um, comparing comparing the different sorts, um, the biodynamic 500 preparation, and just seeing what what effect they have on the soil structure because it, it looks as though the latest research from Rothamsted about the soil structure being affected by um, NPK fertilizers. Um, so it, it just doesn't have the airspace that it should have. Um, so it, it appears that we really need to get something to replace that, that farmers can feel happy with um, and use. You know, I know most of my farm neighbors are using NPK still, um, but if we could get something else that you could actually create from the farm yourself, then that to me would be a game changer for, for a lot of farmers. 
So I saw on the list, um, Rod, that you're um, an organic sheep farmer with orchards. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. So um, with with your farm, um, so you've not been using any sort of um, out of the bag fertilizers. But what do you have? You generally been relying on the sheep fertilizing, you know, helping fertilize or nutrient cycle. Yeah, yeah. We've just been working with a natural you know, rotation of the stock, um, but it's. It just it it because I'm working with neighbouring farmers to try and look at flood management. It I've been trying to encourage them to use effective microbes within the within the farmyard manure treatment and the slurry treatment, just to try and get more microbial action into the soils, and seeing you know, seeing what effect that is actually having um, on flood management amongst other things. So, um, Judith and, and Despina, do you have um, any kind of research knowledge about work that's happening in biofertilizers at the moment? At, at the moment, as part of our Organic Plus projects, it's, it's not particularly, um, or not especially biofertilizers, but we're looking at alternatives to the use of conventional animal manure in organic systems. And Various partners in the project in different countries are looking at other forms of animal wastes. They tend to be things where there is, they're genuinely going to waste in their country of origin. So our Polish partners looking into the use of the sediment that's left over from fish ponds when they've raised freshwater fish for consumption. And our partners in Norway have a lot of uh, marine fish waste, obviously from the, the big fish industry there. Um, so in, in the UK, we're spe we've specifically chosen to focus on vegan organic fertilisers because obviously there, there is a demand for such thing and, and our partners are, are looking at alternative animal waste. So kind of it's, it's, it's opened that up for us. So um, to some extent, we're building on some of the work that's been done historically on the use of Russian comfrey. Um, and we've been um, steeping that in, wa in water um, and similar thing with with nettles as well but we're kind of not so much not so much looking at it from the point of view of um, the biostimulants and, and applying to the land which I think is kind of where Rod's coming from um, we're, we're looking at it I mean this year we're looking at it to feed tomatoes in a in a polytunnel so it's kind of a, slight, a slightly different use we are looking at, word, at other things and we are trying to focus on things which could be on farm derived as well so as well as nettles and comfrey we're looking at legume meal and and a, and a few other things like that but i'm i'm not myself aware of of what research is going on in that area but i, I i'm vaguely aware that there, there is there is research going going on there um, yeah, I've just seen that John Thorns has said that worm juice is a, is a good fertilizer. It depends whether, I suppose, you're talking about kind of targeted fertilizers for particular crops or, or things which are more sort of biostimulants and, yeah, for kind of for outdoors use rather than indoors use as well. Uh, Andy, you'd raised your hand before. Yeah, so there's actually been a lot of really good work around biofertilizers. Um, it, the history actually goes back quite far. So uh, some of the big chemical companies like DuPont and so on have done a lot of research about what the fossil fuel alternatives are. Uh, there's some South American researchers that have taken that knowledge and turned it into um, kind of more grassroots popular education so that it can be done on farm. Um, at Ragman's Lane Farm, which is one of the permaculture demonstration sites, there's, um, they've been doing quite a few years of work around biofertilizers. And there's a guy called, I always get his name wrong, but it's uh, Juan Fran Lopez, who is um, a, a trainer and has, has done a lot of work there. And um, yeah, I, I think the, the biofertilizers themselves are, are, are pretty effective. And I think a lot of work has been done on their effectiveness. It, there's probably a lot of work still to do, though, in terms of trials about how that can be replaced at right, you know, which biofertilizers work best with which crops in the UK. So I think there's, there's, there's a good base to build on. But there's, there's almost certainly more work to do. So do you think, Andy and, and Rod, that there is actually probably quite a lot of um, not that visible interest in within a, quite a lot of farmland around this kind of closed loop nutrient cycling that actually it might Definitely. be worth us utilising our network to say, are people interested in this? Let's just connect connect people together to see what's possible or what people yeah. have, have trialled or, you know, if that is if that's part of that missing missing information. 
certainly the, the understanding from, from research in the States and New Zealand um, is that the biofertilizers are making all the difference between, you know, the amount of carbon capture the soils are making, getting. Yeah. Which, you know, if, if we can, if we, the problem is sort of most, you know, none of my neighbors would, would dream of it unless they, there was something, you know, <laughs> they're not used to it. So it's something completely new. And the fact that they could actually make their own fertilizer out of their own cow manure, um, you know, and a little yeah. bit of cow manure to make a lot of fertilizer by just multiplying the microbes. And that's it, really- it, it would certainly be worth, be worth contacting uh, Matt Dunwell at Ragman's Lane Farm He's got a whole load of kind of previous course participants that were part of the biofertilizer trainings that have happened. And I mean, I think the thing is what once people get it, the, the potential savings on farm are incredible. You know, you, you become self-sufficient for for your 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 fertilizer, basically. It could save a lot of money. So there are there's even potential, I think, for kind of regional, um, you know, kind of a small scale enterprise around producing it. So yes, it's it would be really great to contact Matt. One 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 of the big one of the big problems that we have in the northwest, particularly, is that a lot of it isn't in the um, nitrate vulnerable zone. So farmers are still allowed to spread slurry throughout winter, and mostly they're doing that under duress in conditions that are really bad practice. But they have to do it anyway because they're so. So it's, it's the, the thought has occurred to me many times that if you put the problem that tree surgeons have with not being able to easily dispose of their wood chip and their woody waste together with that problem that the farmers have of not being able to easily dispose of their slurry, if you could organize, it would need to yeah. be some fairly big, fairly imaginative uh, operation to bring the two together. And then out of that could come the kind of thing that Rod is talking about. Yes, in, interesting point there. Um, yes, I think I think there's something there's something that can be done here around connecting interested people, uh, pulling together all the different bits of information. I think it, it seems strikes me that people have gleaned information and evidence from different sources. So bringing that all together into one place is really helpful as a start point and finding out then where where the research opportunities still are. Where are those gaps? Is it a practical gap of not knowing exactly how to physically do it on your farm, how it can work for you and working through that business model? Or is it um, more being convinced of the evidence of its impact? I think there's some, there's some exploratory work that, that could be done there, I think. Um, we've got um, like an ideas page on our website, and I think this would be ideal to put on there um, to, to see what interest there is out there and um, and start to sort of bring out some of that evidence and, and see where the interest is. So I think I think that would be it'd be really good to um, perhaps follow up um, with with you all on that. I saw as well, um, Bill, what you were saying around how um, many um, tree surgeons often really struggle to dispose of woody waste. I mean, certainly Richard, as a tree surgeon, um, trying to do something about that. Um, do you do you recognise that as a as a significant issue too, and hence what started your thinking? Um, around trying to create biochar and, and trying, to, trying to do something with all of that waste. And um, with that, how much energy is required? Um, do you think the cost benefit makes sense with the energy required to what you get from it? So, so our, our, our son is a, is a tree surgeon. And, and so when he was working in this country, he's in France now, when he was working in this country, uh, after each day's work, the, the team he was working with had a problem of what they were going to do with all the arisings from that day. And, and often they, they, they were really struggling. Um, so this idea of um, using excess manure from um, dairy farms, um, livestock farms, as the means for composting what would otherwise, otherwise be quite an inert, s slowly decomposing material seemed just like a common sense solution if anyone could devise a way of of bringing the two together and it yeah. might it, it might mean that that tree surgeons knew farmers who would accept the wood chip and then they could use the wood chip to convert the slurry 
into a farmyard manure that could be applied as a solid waste or something like that. You, you're right, Bill. Uh, the only thing problem is you're probably competing with the biomass market as well. Um, I know quite a few local tree surgeons to us, um, and you're right, they do struggle, but that struggle's become a lot less with right. the biomass industry. Um, for you're getting paid sort of twelve pound a ton uh, for for arborwood chip now. Um, so that would sort of be a, your um <laughs> I suppose in that way um, as I said my first initial was because of the farm that I do have which mm. became an obvious route for me uh, and waste but just as a just to say that that would be a, a sort of competition in that sense so is, is that something you you could try Richard do you do you do you do your house cut cattle produce slurry no no it's dry bed so it's solid waste yeah um, we just use ours a part of it, especially in if there's wetter parts of the yard. So where they trample around the mm. um, next to the feed, it's we find it really good there because obviously it's constant running over. Sure. It. But but even on that small scale, you 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 would if you collect collected that up separately, you yeah. could see how the wood chip composted down, and and you know the different kinds of conditions that would facilitate it and maybe produce a better material than than just just abandoning it to the rest yeah definitely and there's another another element which we touched on before around wood chip um so rod had mentioned here that there's a project in scotland using wood chip as bedding and actually uh, a, a mixed farmer john thorns um in the participants list is saying that um, he beds his cattle with wood chip and also using it around water troughs and gates. Um, in the agroforestry session we had earlier, people were talking about using wood chip uh, as a kind of growth stimulant for the trees that they had planted as well. Feels like a bit of a, a wonder product. But I wonder if John, if you're, if you're willing to tell us a little bit more about when you first started using wood chip, what inspired you to do that? And what have you noticed from, from that? Have you, have you done formal trials or did you find you just kind of took a suck it and see approach? Um, you know, what, what spurred you to do that? And, and are you aware of any research that sort of supports your own, your own observations? Um, not really. We just had lots of wood chip from our woods and it needed using. Uh, and we use it normally as a base and then we put straw over it uh, and it keeps the cattle drier. And then round the water troughs, when they get a little bit muddy, we take, we take a bucket or two from the tractor and put it round the water troughs and it, it keeps them in better condition. So it's just out of it. It's available, so we use it. It's interesting, isn't it? I think that's often how ideas are born. You know, there's a real practical, <laughs> practical element where you've got this thing and you think, well, actually, I reckon that makes sense that I'm going to do that. It won't necessarily be born out of a load of research papers. It's just something that that seems intuitive at the time. Um, but I'm, I'm, I think uh, in my sort of limited experience, I've been working in field labs um, since 2013, but wood chip is something that's come up again and again with a whole variety of different um, uses um, around sort of peat-free compost production. Um, we've been talking about it here for bedding. Um, they're um, uh, talking about using it, as I said before, in, in agroforestry as a, as a growth medium. Is this, um, are you aware of, um, you know, sort of what's hot topic, if, if, if you do or don't know, um, Despina and Judith, around using wood chip and its impacts on, on soil health or, or as growth promotion? Any, um, what's the sort of research side of things? Um, I'm not as certain about wood chip, to be quite honest. I might pass it over to Judith. Um, but I would say that it's um, definitely more research looking at kind of closing the, the kind of cycle of nutrients on the farm. So kind of looking at kind of how nutrients can be kept in the system rather than lost. So it's a more kind of sustainable, um, less energy intensive kind of production system. Yeah, not something I'm, I'm aware of in depth, but I know of a few, a few things um, with it. Obviously, you may have the issue where if you put too much wood, wood chip on, it may deplete the soil nitrogen with the, but the bacteria that break down the wood um, very often use a lot of nitrogen in that process. So that, that can be a concern. And I know certainly in my kind of gardening background, I've come across problems where I've seen kind of really deficient shrubs. And then when I've pulled the wood chip away from them and given them a bit of garden composite, they've then recovered. 
Um, but I, I know one thing um, that's been looked into is if you, if you let that wood partially decompose before you use it, maybe for a year, then that's potentially going to be um, less nitrogen robbing and more useful to the soil. And obviously Ian Tolhurst uses, um, people probably know about his use of, of wood chip. Um, but I think because he actually applies it to the soil just in very small amounts, it's perhaps acting more as a as a stimulant rather than as a as a fertility source. Um, so there's that use. One thing that um, some of our colleagues are looking into is the use of extruded wood. So it's wood that's kind of um, been it's had kind of a lot of pressure applied to it and it kind of busts the fibers apart. So it's it's possible that um, that kind of wouldn't have the, the nitrogen rubbing effect on the soil as well because the wood's already been broken down mechanically. Um, there's also work ongoing um, on the on the bedding side of things with wood, wood with wood chip. Um, depending on the species of wood, there may be other properties to it which are beneficial to livestock. So that they, they may just help with general animal health, there may be beneficial oils in the in the wood chip as well. So okay, I'm not super familiar with, with a lot of this work, but I know that yeah, there, there is scientific work where people are researching wood wood chip. And and I think like like Despina said, it's something that's on farm. So although we're at Coventry we're not looking at this aspect, we have got colleagues in our project that are looking at the full life cycle of inputs in agriculture. And obviously anything which has been sourced on farm is, is going to have a much lower carbon footprint and it's it's normally going to be um, all around better if, it, if it's come from on the farm and that's something that wood chip has normally got on its side, so. So you mentioned you mentioned a project there. Is that um is that is that project um just starting or is that something that's been running for a little while? Because um, that sounds really interesting. It sounds related to a lot of what we've been discussing. Yeah, it's it's the Organic Plus project, and the work that we're doing is, is part of part of this. It's it's quite a big project. It involves I think twenty five institutions in in twelve different countries, and it's I think mostly our colleagues in Italy which are looking at the, the bedding side of of things. Um, so yeah, there, there isn't a, a website for Organic Plus, I'll, I'll post a link in, in the chat for that, but if people have got questions about it, it's probably best just to, just to message me, I'll, I'll put my email address in there as well, and I, I can put you in direct contact with, um, with the people working on that, but yeah, yeah. That would be great, thank you very much. Um, as we've been chatting, we've talked a lot about, um, talked a lot about, um, particularly tree products or tree hay, wood chip, um, a bit about soil health. Um, are there any other questions? Um, I was just looking at the list. We had um, you know, quite a few livestock farmers. Is there anything around actual livestock health that, um, that has been a, like something that you've, you, there's been a niggle that you've wanted to test or any particular challenges that you find, um, particularly with, with where you are in farming at the moment, or is there a regional issue? Um, is there something to do specifically to do with livestock? Because we've not quite covered that. We, we had the biochar project, but I'm, I'm always quite interested in livestock health um, priorities for farmers. Anybody interested in putting their hand up? Um, what, one, one of the issues that um, that's um, constantly cropping up is um, the um, the added value that comes with um, with species rich grass and inclusion, particularly of of, of herbs, uh, as opposed to a um, a straight rye grass clover diet, um, mm -hmm. and um, so that's something that the Cum Cumbria Farmer Network uh, are, are just starting to bring a group together to explore. Um, so that's um, probably going to throw up more questions mm -hmm. as time goes on. But, yes. but I, I suppose the point I'm trying to make is that, that it, it, it's, it, it's not necessarily just the innovative farmers, but there are probably other um, uh, more informal groups that are already formulating ideas, you know, just when they come together to talk about their their day to day problems and then suddenly um, uh, an idea emerges that they they just decide collectively 
to follow up on. Mm. Oh, ab- absolutely. I mean, that's often how ideas actually come into us, where it's a discussion group or a, a supply chain um, a cooperative group where they've discussed ideas for a long time, or they may be trial things in isolation. And then they see there's an opportunity to get access to a researcher, a little bit of grant support to actually just go ahead and do that that trial. Um, but in terms that make sense to them in practical way, that's going to be helpful on farm. I'm, I'm thinking actually the Cumbria Farmers Network might actually be setting up that field lab in partnership with us um, to access um, some of the grant support that we have. Um, I've, I'll double check that, but I've, I've got a feeling if it's Kate Gascoigne at the center of, of that yeah. um, group. Um, we had had um, we've had groups um, further south in Wiltshire and surrounding areas looking at herbal lays for dairy, um, and um, looking at some had some of the farms in the group have been using herbal lays for quite a while, and some hadn't used them before. So there was a lot of um, working out how best to establish, but also it, longevity of the sward as well was an issue you know not wanting to necessarily heavily reseed every year and the costs associated with it so there, there's lots of um potential connections that can be made between trials but obviously the conditions um on the soil types and um issues around establishment they're going to be very different in wiltshire than they are in cumbria yeah. um so it's you know from our perspective it's great to be able to to see um, ideas sort of adapted for different regional areas and different soil types and uplands and lowlands and and all the varieties therein. Um, so yeah, it'd be, it'd be really good to, to if that Cumbria Farmers Network trial um, does does form. It can take quite a long time to define the priorities. I mm-hmm. think to try yeah. and balance that research evidence required to, to make people feel confident that what they've done is telling them what they what they want to know combined with the practicalities and the, and the costs of making making that happen and then that's quite a to and fro um process um that's naturally it's supposed to be a bit challenging if it was super easy then we might come a cropper later on that something might have not been thought about but um you know it's, it is it is very challenging and i wonder actually if if richard um did you encounter that kind of real push pull of trying to make the trial practical or did did you was that something that you hadn't quite experienced at that point i i think um certainly um judith and desmond have probably had very similar <laughs> similar um issues on this but did you find that with your trial uh no i thought it was yeah, it was pretty smooth <laughs> um yeah um yeah, it was, yeah, it went really well. So I, I can't I can't comment to say otherwise that there was major problems really. Um, especially I think with, as I said, Donna's uh, got a farming background anyway, so she knew the sort of um, practicalities of working life, and it had to work around that as well. And it it seemed to fit in, yeah, really well for us. I'm sure it's different for a few others, but well, it can depend if you've got a number of farms working together trying yes. to find that path that what that you're all happy with yeah. trialing or having a design that's very flexible to what people yeah. want to do so I think with Judith's example where she was saying that on the research farmers was I correct you said eight different treatments but the farmers are maybe taking three or four is, is that a good example of where people need to a design is nifty if people can pick and choose what makes sense for them I think so yeah it's, it's got to be flexible so um I think it's it's trying to get the balance right between having enough enough synergies between the different trials that people are doing so you've got consistent data but also it being tailored to what they they can actually manage but um, we were quite lucky because our meeting in february was just before the lockdown and most of the participants were in a room together and it and it was good because they could just you know thrash, thrash it out and you know sort of decide and Tony was really good at guiding them as well as well on and, and guiding us as well, as well and kind of you know tempering the whole thing and, and working out what would be consistent consistent enough but also um manageable enough and appropriate for everybody yeah yeah so is it the case that in a trial with multiple farmers they don't necessarily all have to be doing exactly the same thing is there a kind of threshold if everybody's doing a proportion of the same so you've got replication but other factors can be varied because that makes the idea around collaborating with other farmers on research priorities a little bit more um sort of easy to step into i think i, I think so as well I, th- I think where it is possible to do things the same i, I think you should try to but but not get too hung up on it yeah 
yeah so if, if one farmer decides to throw another two treatments into the mix it's you know it's not necessarily an, an issue and yeah by having replicated trials as well trying to do things at least three or four ideally four times as, as well then it all yeah yeah it's still useful great um I'm I, look could i just ask yes, judith please. um when when you get the results when when the trial is is completed how how is the information how is how are the results used how you because then there is an obligation on somebody you know if, if assuming that that it, it it's going to be useful and relevant is is that the job of the researchers or is it left to the farmers to just distributed amongst their own networks? I haven't quite got that far yet, um, but um, this, this is the first one I've been involved with, but I believe that the innovative farmers um, produce kind of a, a report on, on how things have gone, but, but that will be with our input. And then I think with, with farmers consent as well, we'll, we'll probably you know see if we can use their, their data as part of either of if not a scientific paper then um a report mm -hmm. and scientific papers isn't all we do either we especially because we've got a funded project and also because we work for a research center which is very much about a, applied applied mm -hmm. science so we wouldn't just use the data for scientific papers we'd use it for um reports leaflets um have information on a website for people as well so yeah in in, in, in any way we can in, in, in any way that makes it useful really so so you in effect you have your own network through which you can circulate it anyway yeah yeah but and we would include it within that the um the farms that, that have taken part but yeah other other farmers that mm -hmm. we that we know um and because it's a europe-wide project then in other countries as well yeah yeah, yeah. So it, it's so got legs, them, it goes far. Yeah, with, um, yeah. with the Innovative Farmers Network, one of our big sort of um, reasons for, for being really is to try and share information as it happens rather than waiting right to the end for a final report. Um, I don't know if Dan's um, still with us, he's our communications manager, he might want to say more than I. Um, but uh, we're really keen that trials are put through um, sort of expressed in things like Farmers Weekly, Farmers Garden, online through Twitter, um, and as it happens, because people might be interested in getting involved very early on, and then you could have an, an additional trialist in your area connecting people up, um, giving it, giving things a go as well, and learning as it happens. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges with academic research is that it needs to be peer reviewed, and that it needs it, it's set down to to gather evidence over three or five years, um, and and researchers are very wary of committing to um, you know to state what the results are so far until the very end, until the statistics have all been churned through and everything. But that's not really how farming works, and you're having to make decisions much much quicker. So we try to reflect that in the program. Um, mm. There, you know, we can't have the very highest levels of standards of evidence that some academic institutions can provide, but um, that's not really what we're trying to do. We're not trying to replace research; we're trying to append it. So where you've got field labs that are connecting up with larger research projects, that's that's fantastic because then you're getting both sides of the coin. You're connecting up with researchers that can that can tell you in in plain English actually without having to delve through um, peer review papers what the latest research is and what it's telling you um, and likewise you're able to feed in um, to those researchers the, the practical realities or barriers or you know it, it that sounds great but it's never going to work and um, kind of realism that um, that that can come from knowing that system um, better than anybody else so that's that's really a big part of what we do in innovative farmers actually is to try and oh here we are to hear dan's here he's a communication man this is what dan does he's a, <laughs> he does this for our program and and we're always really keen to share those stories in your own voice you know your own experiences and richard's been a part of that before it's like what did you find what have you done with it how have you used it um that's a really big big part because people don't want to listen to me they want to listen to the farmers themselves so dan I, I don't know if you want to expand on that definitely i think you find that um 
uh, what I found experience from looking at the field levels is there's various different concentric, concentric circles of of involvement. Um, so you get the farmers directly involved in the field level and they're learning, and that's the, be is the, be the best way because someone said in the film we just released, like, you know, farm and research is great because it's instant, you know, the ins results are instant. So you can test them. It's not, not like waiting for an academic report and then having to implement it. It's instant on your farm and you can trial it and see how it's happening in real time. But then you quite often get a field lab, quite often field labs have WhatsApp groups um, which uh, which involve some farmers that might not be have the time or or, or resources to do the, the actual research on their farms, but they're interested in following on. And there's quite often there's big conversations on those WhatsApp groups um, between people to sort of sharing, swapping, swapping tips and sharing ideas. And then there's the, the the bigger kind of network after that of the of the newsletter and the Twitter Twitter audiences that we have. And you know, see you see more and more so that I've seen that it's a, a really collaborative kind of uh, atmosphere between the farmers in our network. Both through, the, through Twitter and, and th through various other forums of trying to help people out um, along the way, and I, so I, you know, I, main jobs, main ways, my job is quite easy because people, farmers are so generous with their time and trying to explain what's going on, and and um, and so it just matters it's just get, getting there and filming it sometimes or getting the right um, press person to attend. Um, but yeah, it's uh, this, it, and then lastly, like the. All, all the field lab information is captured on our website, so you do have to log on, um, you know, to, re to register. But that uh, is a fairly simple process; it's free, and you can then download any re any research papers that are come from the field lab themselves, and they and, and they hopefully will give you a bit of a update about the results. Um, and we also publish this uh, uh, field lab journal every every year, which is a kind of a collection of of various different uh, showcases of the results from the, from the year, for six or so field labs. So that has a some some, some graphs and stuff. I think we um, we also tried to just kind of cut to the chase on on research. Thanks very much for that, Dan. Um, we tried to cut to the chase and um, but encourage conversations. So it might not have all of the detail and every single part that you want to know, but we can put you in touch with the people that have done the work um, and hear and ask the questions um, directly from them. So that's an important part of it. I'm aware of the time and we're nearly at the end of um, our session here. And so unless anybody else has got any sort of burning research questions, um, please feel free to follow up with us if there is something you're interested in please do get in touch um dan's put links to um our website up there and please do get in touch with any of the team um if you're interested in things but things i've sort of jotted down that we've talked quite um a bit about that i think we could maybe um uh, stimulate more conversation on and try and connect up interested interested people around topics and we're talking about the biofertilizers and that sort of closed loop um, biofertilization um, issue on farm and trying to see a what do people already do what are they interested in what are the gaps in knowledge and what are working out what the barriers are in business case to try and make that happen on farm and, and just pull things together a bit more because it sounds like there's lots of information in lots of different areas and around wood chip as well so we've we've had lots of field labs involving wood chip in some form um, this uh, the organic plus project sounds really interested as well again that's another one that maybe we could bring in um you know write something around all the different information that we're aware of and create a space for people to connect up that are interested in that and see what ideas might come from that i think that's something that would be really good and it would be great to to maybe talk to you further judith about um this organic plus project and all the different outcomes that are coming from it that would be really good i do encourage you to read as well richard's um field lab results as he's got so far and we'll be watching with interest where you go with next um on on this um biochar journey richard that's really interesting and also despina's deeper rooting earthworm project which has um is just it's absolutely fascinating and some of the pictures are brilliant from that um from that trial as well what's the timeline despina on on the field lab I, I, my apologies i can't remember um so we have still some more data analysis to do and um, some more on field measurements, but we're planning to get a report finished by the end of um, December. So that should be okay, so up on the, um, the website under the field lab okay. um, link. So. Great. So that's results coming soon. So that's, <laughs> that's really exciting. Um, so we're almost out of time and it will probably cut us off. So I want to really thank our, our speakers, Richard, Judith and Desmina for, for joining us today. And thank you, Andy, for your support as well. And, and for Dan and to all the participants that have stayed with us. Um, like I say, do get in touch if there are any questions you have or research ideas. We'd, we'd love to chat them through with you. There might be other people already that have got in touch with the same kind of ideas that we can connect you with. Um, but I hope you found it interesting and useful. It sort of ebbed and flowed with 
with the way the topics went and um, with what people were interested in. So I'm, I'm really grateful to all the participants there. It's been really interesting um, to listen to everybody's, um, everybody's research so far. So thank you very much for contributors um, on that. And, um, and yeah, and that brings um, NRFC a close for, for this evening. Is there anything you need to add, Andy? No, not at all. Thanks for, for your energy and enthusiasm, Kate. <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, well, we'll know when the recording's available. I think um, we can let people know it'll either be on the NRSC yeah. YouTube site, I think, when that, yeah. when that comes through. I'll upload so it shortly. You. Brilliant. Thank you so much, everyone. Have okay, a good okay. evening. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Take care. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.